So uh, first of all, how many of you guys uh, have a Coinbase account or any digital currency account? Cool, so a few. So, uh, so Coinbase is the easiest place to buy and sell digital currency. And our mission is to create an open financial system uh, for the world. So, so far we've helped about 6 million people. Actually, why can't you see that? Uh, okay, yeah. Yep, so far we've he helped about 6 uh, million people in 33 countries exchange about 6 billion in and out of digital currency. There's three digital currencies we support, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Litecoin. And uh, for the most part, people are using digital currency for some fascinating applications, right? Like cross-border remittances. It's, it's faster, it's cheaper to use uh, bitcoins to transfer money from here to India, from here to Mexico, etc. And there are also you know, use cases like merchants can accept bitcoins and sell goods uh, uh, where they are accepting bitcoins without any chargeback risk. Because bitcoin, fundamentally, if you hold the private key, you are the only person who holds it and knows of it, right? Unless somebody is where to actually extort it out of you, you know, you are the, the person who holds it. All the chargebacks that happen in credit card industry or banking, they all happen because, you know, none of them are able to really verify that you are the true owner of that bank account or the card, right? With Bitcoins, it's, it's a lot easier. Um, and of course, as an alternative investment. Now, the same reasons which make Bitcoin fascinating for you know, uh, uh, all these uh, innovative use cases, they're also the same reasons which make Bitcoins and other digital currencies exciting for you know, uh, the, the bad actors out there. Right? So the, the first uh, uh, reason being that Bitcoin is instant. You can you know, move money instantly. And it is non-reversible. So you know, if I were to send Bitcoins uh, to someone, I can't recover it back. Right? It's like cash. So therefore, yeah, if I'm a scammer, that's the best thing I can steal or buy. Right? So if I have stolen uh, a hoard of stolen credit cards or I have stolen somebody's bank account information, you know, that's, you know, a digital currency exchange is the best ATM I can go to. Right? Because I can steal money from the credit card, buy digital currency, and move it out instantly. Right? Likewise, Anyone who is storing digital currency at, at Coinbase, they are prime targets because, you know, like if you get into someone's account, then you can take the, you can run off with the, the digital currency instantly and no one can recover it, right? Which is why, you know, we like to think of ourselves as a security company first and a digital currency company next, right? Now I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, uh, through the rest of the, the talk, these four topics. First, I'll motivate the payment for problem. Secondly, uh, user security problem. And then I will talk about, you know, how do we detect and prevent fraud. And finally, I'll, I'll present a few interesting case studies. So, uh, first of all, you know, this is the Coinbase sign-up flow. You, um, you know, you give us your email address, you give us your phone number, then you connect either your bank account or your credit card, right? And if you connect your bank account, then in some cases, uh, we ask you to provide us with a username and password for your bank account. In some cases, you can verify your bank account using micro deposits, right? Do you guys uh, know of micro deposits, right? So it's basically a few uh, your dollar, less than a dollar value of deposits that we'll do to your, into your uh, bank, and then you have to come back and enter those micro deposits back at Coinbase, right? Cool. By the way, feel free to stop me, interrupt me any, at any point. So now, what does fraud at Coinbase look like? So the scammer, he steals a first person Alice's bank account or credit card, then steals a second person Bob's identity, driver license, social security number. Third, steals a third person car's mobile phone number. As I said, everybody who creates a Coinbase account has to have a mobile phone number, right? And you have to verify that you have uh, possession of that mobile phone number. And then, you know, buys cryptocurrency and sends it off of our platform to a private wallet that only the scammer controls. Now, Alice finds out, you know, while she's going through a bank statement or credit card statement that somebody did a purchase using a company called Coinbase. So she calls up a bank or card company and disputes the transaction. And then the bank will, in turn, you know, start the, uh, the dispute mechanism with us. And we would, in a lot of cases, have to return the money back to Alice. The scammer ran off with the Bitcoins, Alice gets her money back, and Coinbase is left holding the bag, right? So uh, that's why 
when it comes to whether uh, what our margins would be, et cetera, et cetera, fraud is you know, one of the biggest things that we have to keep in check. Now, account takeover problem. So as I was describing earlier, <clears throat> a user, uh, you know, every user on Coinbase has to have two factors, you know, um, and uh, the two factors that they have to have are the first one is something you know, a strong password, and the second one is something you always have in your possession, right, a physical device. So that's the fundamentals behind second factor authentication. If you have those two factors, then no one can actually get into your account, right? Unfortunately, this is not how 2FA was implemented, right? We said that phone number is actually equivalent to the physical device. That is not true. Why? Because it is actually relatively easy to steal someone's phone number, right? All those SMS-based 2FA tokens that you get on your phone, right? I can get them by redirecting your phone number to a device I control. Or in other words, there's been a huge spurt over the, la the last few months in you know, phone porting attacks, right? Where an attacker basically calls up you know, the telco provider, uh, the call center, and claims that, hey, I lost access uh, to my iPhone, or I, you know, I just bought a new iPhone, can you port my phone number to uh, this new device? Even if you have actually set up a PIN code on your uh, account at any of the telcos, the scammers are pretty crafty. They are able to actually get around it, and they can still convince uh, via social engineering the telco operator that, yeah, you are who you are, and then, lo and behold, they have now your phone number on their phone, right? So therefore, they can actually start getting SMS-based 2FA tokens in their device, right? So the modus operandi, or the MO for these guys is that they first find a list of digital currency investors, uh, then they figure out using LinkedIn, Facebook, et cetera, what is the phone number for those guys, then they basically go on and reset Gmail, Yahoo Mail, et cetera, et cetera, uh, because for all email recovery, you have to provide your phone number you know, as a backup mechanism. Once they have access to your email, as well as phone number, then it's relatively easy to get in anywhere, right? Because we do things like device verification, where if you're logging into Coinbase using a new device, then we will send you a challenge to your email, right? So you can actually click a link in the email if the attacker now has control of the email. And the attacker uh, is anyways not getting two of your tokens on his phone. So now the attacker is, 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 is able to essentially steal Bitcoins, right? Is that clear? I want to make sure that the, the premise is clear. Cool. So, <clears throat> so uh, yeah, recently we've started recommending to Coinbase users that they should, of course, use a strong password and a password manager to store those passwords. And secondly, you know, they, we have been recommending them to move away from anything uh, SMS-based over to you know, TOTP-based apps like Google Authenticator, Microsoft Authenticator, et cetera. Why? Because like, if you guys have ever set up a TOTP uh, you know, using uh, an Authenticator app, then you have to scan a QR code at that time, what is happening is that there's a secret key which is, which is being shared between the website, let's say in this case Coinbase, and your device. And that is actually just being shared by the virtue of you scanning uh, you know, a QR code. That's it. So nothing gets transmitted in the air. And once that QR code has been shared, then both Coinbase and uh, your phone are going to run the exact same algorithm using that secret key to generate a six-digit code. So that's why no one no one can convince a call operator or you know, otherwise uh, gain access to your Google Authenticator-based TOTP, right? So, uh, yeah, so, so now, even though we've basically started telling all our high-value users that, hey, you've got to move away from SMS-based 2FA to uh, TOTP, not everybody does it, right? So, and our 2FA policy is still opt-in, right? We allow people to still use SMS-based 2FA, and we still need to protect them. That's still actually the majority of the user base, right? We still need to protect those guys who are still uh, uh, relying on SMS. So um, um, now we try to use machine learning to detect if a login attempt is suspicious or not, and thereby if a withdrawal from the Coinbase account is suspicious or not. And it's a very hard problem to solve using machine learning, incredibly hard, because in the lifetime of the company, there's only been like, handful of you know, actual account takeovers where we have followed through and we can really say this was not somebody just claiming that he was hacked so he can get his money back, but it was actually truly an account takeover. And therefore the data is highly skewed. And you haven't, we haven't even seen all 
varieties of you know, um, account takeovers such that we could even train a supervised machine learning algorithm. So therefore, you know, what we did was we, we tried to uh, you know, use uh, techniques, like, techniques like association rule mining in order to discover new rules, kind of extrapolate even one example of account takeover that you see and build a rule around it. And we're starting with you know, a few rules and we're gonna basically say, okay, you know, based on this rule, it appears that this login attempt is suspicious and therefore we will delay all withdrawals from this account for the next 48 hours, right? Now, <clears throat> the reason, uh, you know, and, and through the rest of this talk, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring a flavor about, you know, where does machine learning fit in with, you know, non-machine learning systems and how can you design a data-driven product, right? Now, of course, there's gonna be false positives here. The false positive will be that, you know, uh, you, know you, for whatever reason, we detect, uh, you're trying to send cryptocurrency somewhere, we detect that you are an attacker. And that'll be really frustrating. That'll then mean that you have to come back, uh, write to us to our support, and then, you know, uh, it's a very manual, handhold, handheld process. So what we've done is we, we've said that, okay, if <clears throat> there's a false positive, you have the option to actually really prove who you are by uploading your ID together with a selfie, together, so you actually upload the front and the back of your ID, and you take a picture of yourself holding the ID, so we can establish that you are in possession of the ID, and, and we will make sure that the name on the ID matches the legal name on the account, right? If we do that, then we can accelerate this, delayed with, this withdrawal that we delayed for 48 hours, right? Cool, and of course, uh, if you are a victim of an account takeover and somebody truly took, a, took over your account and is withdrawing cryptocurrency from your account, then you will receive an SMS and an email, and you can immediately go in to this view and cancel the withdrawal, or you could actually uh, lock your account uh, immediately because uh, for in that email there's a, there's a uh, one-time URL which is tied to your account which you can click. You go into a portal where you don't even have to enter your password because it's a one-time only URL personalized for you, and you can immediately lock your account and stay at peace that no one is stealing your Bitcoins. At this point, any questions so far? Cool. So yeah, so now um, I'm gonna talk about what do, how do we detect fraud, right? So, so fraud prevention, you know, as I said, it's, it's a hard enough problem that you can't do it using either machine learning or human intelligence alone. So our approach is that you gotta have both of them working in cohesion. And so uh, machine learning algorithms, they train, uh, so, so, so humans, they're labeling users as they are reviewing them. The, the per, as they're reviewing purchase patterns of users, they, train, they label them. Those labels then are used by the machine learning algorithm to learn a new model. And then we present a set of suspicious users to uh, our analysts who then take a look at them and review them and say, no, this purchase pattern looks sketchy. This doesn't look like you know, this person is truly the, the, the account holder and therefore I'm gonna ban the user or I'm going to reduce the limits of the user. So all those actions taken again in turn by uh, the humans, they go in and train the model again, right? So yeah, so we use a variety of supervised and unsupervised um, approaches. So our supervised machine learning algorithm, we call it internally precog. So there are two sets of labels, fraud and not fraud. <clears throat> so we train a, a binary classifier using logistic regression. As I had said earlier, we collect signals from users as they are browsing through the site. So we collect signals around device fingerprint, browser fingerprint, you know, uh, location of the user, email, phone number, et cetera, et cetera. From a lot of those uh, data sources, like from email, we try to find out what are the other social media profiles associated with it, and we find out the name and addresses behind those social media profiles. For, likewise, for phone number, we use data sources to find out who is this phone number registered to, and then again, bring the name and address behind it. For ID, we extract name and address. SSN, we look up uh, I, uh, name and address. And from even the bank account, we look up name and address. So you get the idea, right? So we bring in names and addresses from all these various sources, right? And the output of the model is, it's, it's a logistic regression model, so we are actually using the probability of being fraudulent and mapping it to you know, your purchase limits. Right? So now, the question is, why does even machine learning work here? 
So the first reason is, as I described earlier, we're collecting name and addresses from all these different data sources. And the, the, there's lots of transforms that go in there to decide you know, whether the names and addresses, they mismatch across the data sources, right? However, you know, why, can't we just have, why couldn't we have just used a simple rules-based system? The, the, the reason being that you know, even for real users, the names and addresses, they differ right, across data sources, like Jonathan Kim and John Kim, right? Or people, they move, right? And their addresses are not updated in, in some data sources, right? So in real world, there's all these noisy effects which make this a hard enough problem that you can't just solve using rules-based system and you have to use machine learning. So what we do, so we have transforms like Jacquard similarity where we would take all the characters which are in common between the two names, right? Divided by all the characters which are in the union set of the two names, right? The second reason why machine learning works to detect fraud is uh, because of uh, the, uh, the broken window theory. So the scammers, they're constantly talking amongst each other, right? They discover this new loophole or this new way of defrauding uh, or using stolen credit cards. So <clears throat> they jump into a forum, talk to each other, and as our analysts are you know, observing these guys, they are banning them, we are learning as well, right? So for instance, um, there was a time when we saw the screen resolution 1364 by 768. Now, the pr true probability of uh, this screen resolution occurring uh, in reality is less than 0.1%, right? Because it's not a real screen resolution at all. The scammers, they were using Windows remote desktop protocol to log in to a remote device and pretend to be coming in from a different device fingerprint. And luckily, Windows RDP has a bug via which the, uh, the screen resolution is off by one pixel on each side. So we are really thankful for Microsoft for not fixing that bug. Please don't. And so now uh, our, our, our analysts, they discovered that you know, there's, a, there's a pattern. And they started banning more and more accounts, right? So now you get the idea, right? Our analysts are banning accounts, which are using that screen resolution. And then our machine learning model, which is trained on a daily basis, it picks up and it extrapolates it, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. In this case, it was actually, I'll come to that in a minute, it, how we picked it up. We used anomaly detection to pick it up, yeah. So how do we use the risk score? So, uh, so previously, we used to you know, ban users who had a high risk score. But that would then mean that you know, if you were a false positive, that is, you know, we, we thought you were a scammer, but, but you were really not, then you had no second chances. You could not prove yourself innocent, right? So then what we did was we said, okay, we will allow even the worst offenders, even those who have high, high, high risk scores to purchase Bitcoins from us at say, let's say $5 of Bitcoins per day. And that's almost like then, you know, we're observing you and it's almost like paying for training a model, right? Because we can then observe you for, let's say, 60 day period. And if we see that, you know, you are truly actually, you know, innocent, then, you know, the machine learning model will, will, will correct uh, itself, right? So, uh, yeah, and now you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go through a few more details about our model. So, uh, as I said, logistic regression, you know, we, of course, you know, uh, want to have the model be generalizable because it, it would work much better uh, with respect to unseen data. So two ways of achieving generalizability or reducing uh, bias is, is basically, first is use regularization, right? So that is a nice way of doing feature selection, right? Instead of somebody hand uh, hand-tuning features, right? You can just throw all the, the features there and let either L1 or L2 regularization figure out which features are important and only keep them in the model, right? Secondly, you know, use cross-validation uh, to pick the hyperparameter. So, you know, like we divide the, the training set into uh, uh, chunks of uh, five, five subsets, train model on four, test on the fifth, and then do that five times, and then you figure out, you know, out of all hyperparameters that you could be using for the models, which one performs the best with respect to your metric. And then you pick that hyperparameter, you pick the best regularization, and you then train that model on the entire training set. Right? Now, um, you know, a nice intuitive way of understanding how regularization helps. So if there are, like, so multicollinearity, or rather, like, having two features which are, like, highly correlated with each other, can be bad for the model, right? So regularization helps there. Because if you use L1 regularization and two features are highly, highly correlated, 100%, then L1 will pick just one of them, right? And 
make the other one zero. L2 will basically give both of them equal coefficients. Right. So our machine learning pipeline, uh, uh, we train our model using Vopal Wabbit. I don't know how many of you guys use Vopal Wabbit in the room. Two? Awesome, yeah. So love, love Vopal Wabbit. And um, it's, it's an open source software written by uh, John Langford, uh, I think from his time at Yahoo Research and Microsoft Research. And uh, the really nice thing about Vopal Wabbit is that, okay, it can do, um, it can learn a stochastic gradient descent model you know, uh, online, using, uh, in, in a streaming fashion, right? And the other nice thing about it, which, you know, some, which I, I think is still relatively unknown, is that it has a daemon mode. So how many of you guys have to de had to deal with exporting the model uh, using XML-like formats, or if you're using Python, then pickling the model? Yeah, cool. So, yeah. So, when I started at Coinbase about two years ago, I had a, it was just me and an intern. So we were able to basically build a model really, really quickly, launch it really, really quickly by not worrying about, you know, exporting models and PMML and pickling, et cetera, et cetera, by just actually exploiting this, uh, this thing in Wapal Wabbit where you can run it in daemon mode, right? So what we did was we run Wapal Wabbit in daemon mode. Uh, and then we have a, a, a Python uh, G events, you know, greenlets based G events, uh, wrap it around it, and, uh, and it, it works. It's, uh, it works really well, flawlessly. It, it never really goes down. You know, uh, scales very well. And now, okay, so the, the model training pipeline. So you know, our production database is Mongo, uh, production code base is in Ruby. So we do feature extraction using Python. And then we basically uh, apply transforms using Python as well. And then we uh, generate uh, a data set for Wapal Wabbit, which trains a model. And then when we have to deploy the model, we just essentially copy Wapal Wabbit's representation of the model over to the server, right? And then when we need to score a user, we just send the feature vector you know, uh, from our production database to the server. It's actually, you know, we. Because we wanted to launch very, very fast, we designed it to be stateless. So on the scoring side, there is no state. All state, when we want to even score a user, is being generated using the production code base, right? Which has its own set of issues, and now we, I'll, I'll talk about them. So first of all, let me talk a little bit about metrics. So, uh, you know, for logistic regression, uh, you know, it's a binary classifier, so you could have two metrics, right? Area under the curve which will allow you to know how well is the model performing with respect to separating out good users and bad users, right? However, if you remember, we are no longer banning people, right? So even for our business use case, it doesn't match. And this is something which, uh, uh, yeah, unfortunately, textbooks or schools don't really teach, right? Like, uh, how do you map machine learning metrics to the business metrics, right? So, uh, Whereas log loss, which is essentially, you know, how close is the probability of being fraudulent? You know, how close is that value to one for fraudsters? And how close is that value to zero for good guys, right? That maps very well to our use case, right? Because if you recall, what we're doing is we're taking your probability of being fraudulent and giving you a purchase power based on that, right? And then the business metric is fraud rate. So we measure how much losses we took from chargebacks, right? From all the Alice's in the world calling up the banks. That's the numerator. The denominator is uh, the purchase volume, right? And, uh, you know, this is a period of uh, uh, more than a year, or a year rather. So you can see the goal. Um, we started at, at a, you know, uh, when we started this about two years ago, it was actually much higher than that. And we've been consistently able to, to keep it below now, except a few months here and there. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, did, if, when I told you about you know, how we are ascribing risk score and thereby limits to people, people treat the, the, the purchase limits on Coinbase uh, very religiously. It's, it's, it's almost to them like a credit limit on a credit card, right? And uh, the, so if you can imagine, I don't, I don't have a slide for this. As uh, we are learning more and more about a user, right? You know, you do more purchases. We see your purchase patterns, right? Scammers typically, if they have access to a bank account, you know, there are two kinds of patterns. They will, you know, let's say we gave them a $10,000 a week limit. You know, the greedy ones, they will steal $10,000 every week. 
the more sophisticated ones will try to add some randomness over there, right? So, uh, uh, so yeah, so, so therefore, our machine learning model, it is actually observing everything that you're doing, and we keep rescoring you as you're doing more and more things on our platform. And therefore, as you're doing more and more things on our platform, we learn a new score, your purchase power changes, right? But you can't change it too often either. If you change it too often, then this is what happens. If there's a bug introduced in our, in our model, then uh, we have a very uh, loyal uh, uh, you know, customer base. They get onto Reddit or they write to support, and then they freak out. Man, my limits are going crazy. <laughs> what happened to them? This was actually you know, uh, you know, something we fixed thereafter by essentially saying that, OK, we're not going to score or rescore users all the time. We will score them you know, uh, only at certain uh, you know, lifetime intervals, et cetera. That's one way. The other way, at this time, what had happened was that we had deployed a model, and there was an error. And that's what I wanted to talk a little bit about. How do you actually validate models, right? And how do you validate that your model is going to do what you expect it to do? Because you know, if you go wrong, if you make a mistake, that's, that's a support nightmare, right? So yeah, so as I said, we, are <clears throat> we have two different code bases, for one for training and one for you know, scoring, right? Uh, feature engineering as well as transforms, as well as the databases, the underlying databases, they are totally different. So that now means that you know, when we are training a model, right, we train the model uh, you know, using uh, uh, VOP Alvabet. And if the model's metrics are really, really good compared to the production model that we had trained and deployed, a f let's say, a few weeks earlier, then we want to not deploy this challenger model into production. But you can't just do that because, as I said, you know, if we deploy it now, you know, uh, because we trained it using, you know, path, using Python and Redshift, in our case, based uh, environment, and if we deploy it, then the scoring is going to be done using Ruby and MongoDB environment. So we can't just do that. You know? So what we have to do is, you, know, you first take a set of users, right, and you compute the same feature vector you know, using both the code bases, and then you essentially uh, you know, you run an algorithm which compares the feature vectors and figures out are there too many discrepancies. And you also figure out are there too many discrepancies in the scores, right? And you know, this is also very, um, it's, it's, it's a little hard problem because you know, databases are not going to be always like, you know, in sync either, right? There is an ETL process, for instance, which is moving data from one uh, data from a production database to our, you know, uh, from a production MongoDB database to a Redshift database, right? And at the same time, users are doing stuff, right? So they may have purchased more stuff by the time we actually did even this, this sort of validation or verification, right? So therefore, yeah, you can't always get that validation right. You have to essentially look at, okay, did the other scores, you can't really solve the problem that other scores exactly the same using the two code bases. But you can say, are they not differing too much? And then you plot the histograms of the differences. And then you know, uh, if, it, if, if it's not too much of deviation, then you go ahead with it. The second thing you have to do is that, you know, the second thing we do is that we then uh, deploy the challenger model in production. Now, this is a problem, or, or, or the, the problem here is we train the model using logistic regression, which internally is using log loss to decide the best model. right? But we don't know if that machine learning metric corresponds to a business metric, right, or fraud rate. So therefore, what we do is we deploy the challenger model in shadow mode. We score the user using both the models, production and challenger. But we assign limits or you know, uh, uh, purchase power only using the production model. And then we uh, you know, compute the uh, distribution for a set of samples for good users on the left and bad users on the right. And if it doesn't look too bad, then we actually go ahead with uh, moving the challenger model to be the production model. One of the other things we have to do, and we have to be really, really careful about it, is that there's high value users on our platform who may have, um, I think the highest purchase limit on our platform right now is $15,000 a week, right? And you don't want to mess with that, right? So what we do is then we take a set of, we take actually all the high value users and we see what are their scores with the challenger model and thereby compute how much is the purchase power going to be after this new model is deployed. There will be false positives, right? And we have, you have to learn to live with false positives if your model, you know, in the long run, 
in the, with respect to the log loss metric is actually accurate, then you might as well accept the false positives. But what you have to do is then you take all those users or the, the whales whose scores will go lower, whose purchase power will go lower, and then you manually go in and increase the limits or lock the limits, right? So that once you deploy the new model, nothing, nothing bad happens to them. Cool. So now, yeah. So, so as I said, you know, like um, in a startup world, you have to be expedient, pragmatic, etc. So you know, we we got a new model uh, going in, in in a three month time span using uh, two of us. And now, as the team grew, we realized that you know we can actually do much better, right? We can actually uh, uh, basically not have not have these two code bases. So this is our new architecture which we're working towards. And what we want to achieve is, you know, for all the data that we are interested in with respect to training a model, we will actually send all of that data, you know, uh, from a production database to, you know, uh, I have DynamoDB over there to another to another microservice which has its own data store, right? And then we'll have to ensure that the uh, this this microservice data store is actually in sync and it's not lagging too much, too behind the production database. That's one uh, metric we'll have to uh, make sure we hit. And then we will have the same library which extracts signals and does uh, transforms, right? And now when you need to uh, get, get a score, right? Or sorry, when you have to train a model, then you basically just use, uh, use this data store, right? The DynamoDB data store to train a model. And when you need to get a score, you basically hit a user ID Right, and uh, you take this, the 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 signals and the transformed feature vector, and then you get a score using uh, that same uh, data store. Right, so that's that's what we are driving towards. Now I wanted to give you a flavor of uh, where does you know supervised machine learning fail. So the first thing is the chargeback window is is very large. Right, so you can't really. Uh, rely on getting a label that the user is fraudulent after 60 days, right, or six months. So you gotta use unsupervised approaches in order to extrapolate human intuition. So there's three of them. The first one, as I mentioned, is anomaly detection. So what we do is we basically take a uh, look at, okay, how many people are signing up with Wells Fargo Bank issued credit cards on a monthly basis? And in any given week, if that num the red line is the, the weekly ratio, in any given week, if the number of users signing up using Wells Fargo exceeds, then we know there's something wrong. Then we quickly go and look at all those users who signed up that week and find out what's wrong. And that's how we found that, that screen resolution ring. Then the second one is related users detection. So if you ban a user, right, then you know, like if two accounts they share the same social security number or same bank account number, then they are controlled by the same individual. So if we know that this account was created by a fraudster, then very likely the others were created by the fraudster as well. So we have uh, you know, a, determ a deterministic way by which we can link, a link accounts. We also have a probabilistic way. The probabilistic one basically just takes the feature vectors of, of all the accounts and computes the cosine similarity between them. And if they are very similar, then once an uh, admin, an analyst bans an account, we present all other related accounts that they can act on. The third thing is, uh, you know, we've built a custom rules engine. So our analysts, as they are looking at, you know, accounts and finding these rings, they're like, they're, they're discovering, uh, you know, uh, okay, there's a J.P. Morgan uh, Chase Bank issued ring. You know, all of them are using, let's say, Verizon phone numbers, and uh, then they say, okay, let's actually restrict the risk score to this value, right? Now, um, some of the actions we allow the, the risk engine or the rules engine to take is, okay, you can either ban the user, you can restrict the risk score, or you can require an ID upload, right? And what we're working towards is, you know, automatically discovering rules, right? So that would be like uh, uh, the holy grail here, right? If you can actually have anomaly detection, detect rules, and then you input those rules, and then you can remove a lot of the, the, the human intervention out of the picture. I'll give you uh, a, one case study here, which we call the Verizon debit card ring. So these are actually fake IDs. They have just different driver license numbers, right? And they were photoshopped, right? And we call it the Verizon ring because, as I said earlier, you know, it's very easy to actually uh, start seeing SMS 2FA codes you know, um, online. Previously, we used to think that in order to create an account on Coinbase, 
it's high enough friction for, you, for scammers that they have to purchase a phone and verify, verify your phone. It's actually easy, right? There's temporary, uh, th there's websites where you can actually get SMS 2FA codes online, right? And also, Verizon has this major loophole. If any of you have Verizon phones, come talk to me after this. Verizon has a major loophole where, you know, if I as a hacker have access to a username and password for Verizon, I can see all text messages you receive, including 2FA codes, right? So therefore, if I'm a scammer, that's the best phone number, uh, that's the best username password of, of any carrier to purchase, right? So I would go look at, you know, uh, password leaks of Verizon phones, and lo and behold, I can now, you know, use a, Coi a Verizon phone number to validate a Coinbase account. And the person whose Verizon phone number is being used, he's not even aware that his phone number is being used to verify a Coinbase account, right? Yep, so we detected this ring, you know, as I said, using, uh, actually in this case as well, using anomaly detection. Because cameras, they always leave, you know, they, they, they always leave something wanting. They, they always make one mistake. So in this case, they use the same screen resolution, right? So anomaly detection picked it up. And then we basically, uh, you know, uh, as the user was adding more and more cards, you know, and we had already seen that card being used on other band accounts, then we immediately, use machine learning to figure out that this, was, this new account is a scammer as well, and therefore we reduce the risks, uh, reduce the purchase power of that user. So all in all, you know, with some human intervention, both supervised and unsupervised approaches, they helped us in this case. And uh, don't really have much time, but you know, I thought I would share with you uh, some interesting ideas. So for instance, we, when I said we require users to upload an ID, right? And as I told you earlier, that you, know, you have to also do your you know, selfie together with your ID. This is, this is the, the stuff we got yesterday. Really no vice. But yeah, so um, that's my email address, soups at uh, you know, This is the team, 15 people now. So seven analysts and eight engineers who wear a variety of hats. You know, uh, data engineers, machine learning engineers, front-end and back-end engineers, and we are hiring for all the roles. And if you remember anything from this talk, then SMS two-factor is dead. That's it. Thank you.